I want to begin our teaching time by turning to God's Word, and I'm going to be reading from Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 41 through 44, the end of this chapter. Um, if you brought Bibles along, you're welcome to follow along with me, or we'll put the, put the words up on the screen here. Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 41. So let's listen to God's word. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. May God bless his word to our hearts, to our minds this morning. So the place here is Herod's temple in Jerusalem. And there are these boxes scattered around the, the temple court where people can come and, and put in money. And Jesus is there, it says. Jesus is there in the temple and, and, and he's watching. He's watching as men and women, much like yourselves, Men and women were walking into the temple and going up to the offering boxes and, and making their gifts. And he seems as though he's watching very carefully with a great deal of interest. And he always does. I believe that Jesus is concerned about what we do with our money. He pays attention to how you manage your finances. He's interested in how you respond when the offering plate gets passed up and down the road. People sometimes say, you know, I wish ministers wouldn't talk so much about money. I've heard that. I've said that. Maybe you have too. But it, here's what I think is the truth. I believe it is impossible to preach the gospel and not talk about money. Did you know that Jesus had more to say about money than he did about being born again? He actually had more to say about money than he did about heaven or hell? And if this is such an important topic for Jesus, do you think it should be an important topic for us as well? So that's why we're spending a few weeks on this, four weeks, to talk about our relationship to our finances, our relationship to money. Uh, we believe it's worth it. It's worth the time. And it's why we do it every year about this time as you may have noticed. I believe, we believe that it's impossible to preach the gospel without saying something about what we do with our money. So why do you think Jesus was so concerned about money? Well, I see a couple of things. First of all, I think Jesus was watching the offering box in the temple because money is power. Money is power. Over the centuries, people have turned money into much more than just simple scraps of paper and, and little pieces of metal. Money is, is bottled up energy. It can be used to corrupt lives, to, to defeat justice, and to destroy. It can be used to inhibit the growth of God's kingdom in the world. But... Money can also be used to grow 
God's kingdom in this world. It can be used to heal and to restore communities and neighborhoods and families and to help rebuild broken lives. So I think Jesus is naturally interested in the financial power that each of us has access to. Jesus is also interested in the offering box because what we do with our money is actually a clue to our character. A person who invests heavily in pleasure is by nature a pleasure seeker. A person who uh, spends a lot of time and energy reading and, 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 and gathering and looking at books and, and all that is by nature probably a lover of literature. Now a person who invests heavily in the church of Jesus Christ is more likely to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Of course, a person can be generous and, and can give freely without being a Christian. But I believe it is impossible, it's impossible to be a follower of Jesus and to be selfish and mean and stingy. Every offering that is taken is an important opportunity. Each time you have an opportunity to be generous, generous with your money, generous with your time, generous with your, your abilities and your skills and your gifts, each time you have an opportunity to demonstrate generosity, it is an op opportunity to demonstrate your character. And if the chance to be generous turns you off, if it bores you, if it annoys you, even makes you a bit angry, then you have demonstrated something of your character. When we refuse to be generous, we choose instead to be selfish. But if we give, if we give gladly, if we give extravagantly, we demonstrate the same character as that of Jesus. God's children are meant to share his character. And one of God's divine characteristics is generosity. God's children are also generous. So just as Jesus watched people move back and forth past the offering boxes in the temple, Jesus also sees our actions when opportunities to give enter our lives. He sees what we do. If we ignore opportunities to be generous, he sees that. If we are selfless and our giving is extravagant, he sees that too. Now, what did Jesus see in the temple? Well, it says he saw many rich people give large gifts. They were interested in the work of God's temple. They supported it financially. It says some even gave large amounts. They weren't selfish. And thank God that there are people like that today. There are still rich people who are not too tired on Sunday mornings to join God's people in, in worship. And, and many of them give generously to support the ministries of the church. And as Jesus watched, he noticed a woman who did not put very much into the offering box. A poor widow came, the story says. I think we can assume that this is, this is a woman who, who had suffered. And it says she knew and was experiencing the pinch of poverty. All that she had in the world was, was right there in her hand. Right there. That's it. Now, was she ashamed that, that she had so little to give? But she couldn't keep it for herself. She, she had to give it away. So this, 
this poor widow, she placed into the offering two copper coins. It says only worth just a few pennies. Now when the temple treasurers counted up that day's offering, do you think that they were impressed with that widow's gift? It was nothing. It was nothing. It was just a couple pennies. Hardly worth counting. If it had fallen on the floor, would any of them actually have stopped and bent over to pick it up? How many of you, when you see a penny, a penny, one penny laying on the floor, will actually stop and pick it up? Yeah, I, I mean, I know there's a lot of Dutchmen in our church, so I hesitate asking that question. I, I tried that out last week in Grundy and in Lincoln Center, and it was almost like everybody raised their hand. I thought, okay, all right. Didn't think through that very well. <laughs> so, okay, so some of you will take the effort. But then what are you going to do with that? What are you, it's not worth very much. They even talk about getting rid of the, getting rid of the penny. Any excitement that day with the treasurers as they counted up the collection was probably over these large gifts that the rich had placed in the offering boxes. Only Jesus recognized the true value of this widow's gift. I tell you the truth, Jesus said. This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. Now, how could that be? What was it that Jesus saw in this widow's small gift that made it so extravagant? Why did Jesus think it counted so much more? Well, I think it was more, first of all, because it represented more faithfulness. More faithfulness on the part of the giver. This widow, she just, she just had a couple of coins. And what can you really do with such a small gift? What could that kind of a gift mean to God, the creator of everything? But it meant so much to this widow because it was all that she had. The human thing for her to do since she was so strapped financially would have been to, to do nothing. Keep them. Certainly she could justify not tithing for that month. She's got other responsibilities. She's got food to buy. She's got clothes to, to keep on her body and maybe, you know, to clothe her children probably and maybe a home, a place to live. She most likely has a family, children to care for, and she's a widow. It's her responsibility. There's nobody else. It's looking out for her. People would understand. God would understand, wouldn't he? How many of us think like that? I do. I have. Deb and I have. We've wondered that. We've even chosen that from time to time. And we probably will again at some point in our life. But what's really behind that kind of an attitude? Simply put, it's, it's unfaithfulness. It's a lack of faith in the power of God. An unwillingness to surrender to God's control. What it is instead is putting faith in ourselves, in myself. Putting myself before God. Jesus said the person who's unfaithful with little will also be unfaithful with much. You see, it's not a question of how much good your gift will do. It's a question instead of your faithfulness and how you handle what you've been given. You know, I really don't care how much money you put in the offering from week to week. What I do care about 
is whether or not you, in your life, are being faithful to God with the resources that he has given to you. This woman was faithful. She didn't give because she felt like it. It had nothing to do with feelings. She gave because she was being obedient to a trustworthy God. Now some people, some people will give because they support what a church is doing. They feel good about what's happening at the moment in their church. But then things change. Things change. And we've experienced some change over these past months, haven't we? And we'll experience more change in the months to come, in the years to come. So things change, and then some people don't feel quite as good anymore. So what do they do? They stop giving. Now that type of giving is motivated by feelings, by personal preference. It's not motivated by faithfulness. That's not the type of giving that Jesus is looking for. Jesus commends those who, whatever the situation, are faithful with what God has given to them. And it took an incredible amount of faithfulness for this widow to give this small amount. Far more than was required of the rich who gave large amounts. So the second thing is that this, this widow's gift was also extravagant because it was so costly. There was sacrifice in what she did. It was extravagant. And Jesus saw the rich give freely but he didn't say that they gave sacrificially. They came in rich, and they most likely left rich. Their gifts were large, but they only gave what they didn't need themselves. They gave out of their, their excess. The widow's gift cost her everything. You know, when those two coins slipped out of her fingers, her hand was empty. There must be sacrifice in our giving. And if not, how can it be called generous? Jesus sees giving that costs something. That's the kind of giving that Jesus demonstrated, right? He gave everything. His gift was extravagant. What did it cost him? His life. Our gifts should cost us something too. On one of my earlier trips to Haiti, our group had an opportunity to bring a truckload of rice and beans to a very impoverished rural neighborhood. And this extravagant gift of, of food that we brought um, were shared with, with a number of families. And many of these families were composed of a widow and her children, or maybe her grandchildren, or both. And we were so excited. We felt so good about, about sharing in, in such a generous way. And then, uh, then a few days later, we were told that many of these people, many of these widows, went home that night carrying their bags of rice and beans on their head, walking back along the paths to their huts, to their homes, and they prepared a huge meal. Some of them prepared all of the food that we gave them, and then they invited their families, and they invited their neighbors, and they invited their friends, and they invited others, and they shared. They shared all that we had given to them with others. They didn't hoard it. They shared it. And I remember our generosity suddenly was so humbled by the generosity 
that these starving people had demonstrated. That's the sort of extravagant generosity that Jesus sees and blesses. And one last thing, uh, this widow's gift was extravagant also because, because there was love in her giving. Her gift would have been worth less if there was no love involved. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, if I give away all I have and if I deliver my body to be burned but I have not love, I gain nothing. The richest gift is worthless to God if there's a wrong motive behind it. On the other hand, the smallest gift is beautiful beyond words if it is given for love's sake. Jesus saw into this woman's heart. She wasn't looking for attention. She wasn't looking for applause. Real love is active. It, it insists on doing something. And it'll do something big if it can, if it has the ability, if it has the resources. But if it can't, it'll do something small, something obscure, something hidden. But it will always do something. You can count on it. Love will give. Love will give of its best. And the best is what Jesus sees. So what, what can we remember from this story? Well, first, number one, everyone is equal when it comes to giving. Everyone is equal when it comes to giving. Those of us with the smallest gifts have exactly the same opportunity of honoring God as those of us with the largest gifts. We only get into trouble when we start worrying about who's got the best or who's got the most to give. Who's the most generous? What we can be sure of is that Jesus sees and is, and is pleased with generosity that is faithful, that is sacrificial, and that is motivated by love. Number two, remember that even the smallest gifts, if they are our best, are not looked down on. We like to measure stuff. We like to measure things. What's most, what's biggest, what's best. Especially stuff related to money. And we get confused into believing that more is better. Jesus doesn't count like we do. He doesn't. What matters to him is what inspires our giving. If, if two very small coins are, are our best, then Jesus sees that. He blesses it and he considers it to be extravagant and valuable. And then finally, since Jesus cares about our giving, let's make sure that nothing keeps us from being generous. Don't let anything get in the way. Don't stop because you feel sorry for yourself. Don't stop because others feel sorry for you. Jesus didn't stop this poor widow from putting her last two coins into the offering box. Did you notice that? He could have. He could have stepped out and said, no, 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 no. You need that. Don't do that. You know, we got some problems here in the, in, the, in the temple, too. Did you notice that? You know, there's some things we need to fix um, and, and, and make right. So don't, you know, don't. He didn't. He watched her do that. He watched her heart. He noticed it and he blessed it. Don't stop. Don't stop. Extravagant generosity is a sign of extravagant faithfulness in God. Luke says it this way, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with a measure you use, it will be measured to you. A hand that is wide open to give will also be wide open to receive. And to receive the best. Maybe not necessarily to be blessed in return financially but the gift that God will give to you in return for your generosity will be the best thing that he can give to you. The Lord doesn't hesitate to accept our last penny 
because that kind of giving doesn't impoverish us, us, but it makes us rich forever. And the story is challenging. Um, We know that. It's challenging for me because it shows us how different God's perspective is from our perspective. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, the Lord does not look at things like people look at them. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. This, this poor widow gave extravagantly. And this is the call of the gospel. Absolute surrender to God. So don't let your money be the master of your life. Instead, give of your best to the master. Let's pray. God, I'm not sure how these words set with each of us, each of the hearts that are in the room. I'm not sure how this series on generosity will challenge each of us specifically, but I've just got to think that it will. Um, That these words from your word over these weeks will will push us, uh, may make us uncomfortable, may make us feel guilty and ashamed at times, but I I firmly believe that you don't motivate us through guilt and shame. You call us to live a life of faithfulness and freedom and joy. Help us to help us to consider our lives. Consider maybe how our resources, our money actually enslaves us and actually how we can, through living a generous life, we can find true freedom in you. Help us, Father, to trust you, to surrender our lives to you, and to demonstrate our trust in you through our generosity. And thank you for showing us the way. And now accept our worship. Amen.